I'm uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the class uh, this Wednesday night. We're in the study of Romans, and we left off at uh, verse five of chapter twelve last time. So we'll start with verse six. <clears throat> it says uh, there, having then gifts uh, differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. And we'll go on down in 13 in this, uh, the other attributes too, but we'll get to that in a moment. So we, uh, conclude from the 12th chapter, uh, well, actually 12th, 13th, 14th chapter of, uh, First Corinthians. That gifts refer to the miraculous. Uh, but here, not in every case, uh, the time of Paul's preaching was a time of miracles, and the Corinthian brethren were misusing these miraculous gifts. Uh, the phrase, gifts given to us, does not say that all Christians receive the same gifts, or any gifts at all, and is referring only to those who receive gifts. It was not necessary for all Christians to have gifts. Uh, of those who did receive gifts, those gifts differed from one recipient to the other. The specific gift given, if it were given at all, was predicated on the grace or favor of God and was in proportion to the degree of faith one possessed. As Paul wrote in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse seven, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, not all Christians had the measure of belief to allow them to properly exercise the gift. Each one having a gift was to confine himself to his special gift, to do what the gift empowered him to do, and no more. Furthermore, he was not to magnify the importance of his gift to the diminishing of another's gift. Even the Corinthians, who apparently had a sufficient measure of belief to properly exercise the gifts bestowed on them, abused these gifts, necessitating that Paul correct these abuses. The modern concept of uh, Prophecy or prophesy is the foretelling of some future event. In Paul's time, it meant to give expression to uh, the divine mind or will, whether that uh, will respected the past, present, or future. The prophet might teach history. He might instruct in present duty. Or he might foretell the future. So the prophet is a forth teller. And I've said this before. Uh, he, he may be a forth teller rather than exclusively a forth teller. The prophet then in his very essence is a, an inspired teacher. In continuing the uh, thought in verse 6, says, our ministry, let us use our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, and of course, it'll continue on in the verse 8. We'll get that in a moment. So the gifts noted here and in verse 8 to follow are not necessarily miraculous gifts since, for example, it does not take a miracle to minister, exhort, give liberally, or to show mercy. However, the Apostle Peter refers to spiritual gifts in 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, verse 10, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. There, minister, quote unquote, is the same word as used here, and so is gift. Today, of course, we minister, teach, exclusively of any miraculous manifestation. 
the word the Greek word translated here as ministry is the same word from which is derived deacon. Whether Paul had in mind the service rendered by deacons or others is not here known. Ministry is a service of a religious nature, which, of course, could be rendered without inspiration. A prophet was engaged in foretelling. A teacher's duty was to retell that which had been taught by the prophet. The design of the prophet's preaching was to bring men to Christ. The de design of teaching was to protect them once they had been brought to Christ. <clears throat> now we get to verse uh, 8. He who, ex who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy, mercy with cheerfulness. <clears throat> Exhortation is an appeal to alien sinners to render obedience to Christ and to Christians to do their duty to Christ. <clears throat> Exhortation includes both an appeal to the sinner and the saved. Where we have the prophet preaching the gospel to those uh, without, the teacher to instruct those within, and exhort the exhorter to assist both. He who gives must do so without uh, pretension or ostentation. Jesus said in Matthew, the sixth chapter, verse two, therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet for you as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the street, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. <clears throat> he who leads must do so uh, diligently, that is, with unremitting attentiveness to those duties that effective leadership demands. <clears throat> the Greek word translated lead is the same root Greek word setting forth the qualification of elders found in 1st uh, Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> Mercy consists of acts of kindness done to the sick, the poor, the unfortunate. The general meaning is to have compassion or mercy on a person in unhappy circumstances, implying not merely a feeling for the misfortunes of others uh, involving sympathy, but also a, an active desire to remove those miseries. Such mercy must be offered in a cheerful as opposed to a depressed manner. Cheerfulness inspires hope and brightness in the, need, in the needful, while a negative presentation serves only to exacerbate the unfortunate circumstances. <clears throat> In verse 9, it says, let love be without hypocrisy, hypocrisy or uh, King James as dissimulation. Abhor what is evil, uh, what is evil, clean, in both King James and ASB as cleave. You can see the connection there. Clean to what is good. Hypocrisy or uh, dissimulation comes from uh, the Greek and conveys the idea of a stage actor pretending to be something that he is not, that he is playing a role. Paul is saying that uh, love, that is the agape form of love, should be unfeigned without pretense, sincere. Evil is not uh, to be merely avoided, but it must be abhorred, that is, hated, detested with horror. The poor is only found here, but the idea is not. 
the prophet Amos wrote that one should hate evil and love good. That comes from the fifth chapter of Amos, verse 15. Evil means uh, mischief making, uh, delighting in injury, doing evil to others, dangerous, destructive, and you could add a number of other uh, descriptors. Uh, cling is from the same Greek word translated joined in Matthew, the 19th chapter, verse 5. <clears throat> For this reason, a man shall leave his father and, and mother and be joined or cleave, King James and ASV, and be uh, joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. What is good is in opposition to what is evil. The idea then is to cling to good no matter what. Not to cling to what is good and not to abhor what is evil can only result in sin. <clears throat> Verse 10 says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor giving preference to one another. <clears throat> kindly affectionate, affectionate comes from the Greek word philostorge. It's a combination of brotherly love, philo, that's where we get the word, word Philadelphia, and family love, which is storge. It is the love that parents have or should have for their children. This is the love that fellow Christians are to have for one another. Honor means, of course, honor, respect, reverence, esteem. Giving preference is to esteem the other more highly than oneself. The idea is given in Philippians, the second chapter, verse three, <clears throat> that nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, that each esteem others better than himself. In the 11th verse of chapter 12, it's continuing the same thought, not lagging, and uh, King James and SB is slothful. In diligent uh, business in the King James Version, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Not lagging in diligence. That is, that is to expend every effort to one's very best in attempting to do something as in Second Peter, the first chapter, verse 5, but also for this reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, virtue knowledge, and so forth. One must be industrious in service to the Lord. One must have a deep earnestness and commitment in serving the Lord. No service to the Lord is to be done with indifference. In verse 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Be joyful by reason of hope. Hope helps, helps the Christian to be patient and steadfast in trials and tribulations. At the time of Paul's writing, Christians were suffering persecutions or were about to suffer such. Hope carries the Christian beyond the suffering. In prayer, we are to cast our cares upon him. <clears throat> the Apostle Peter wrote in uh, 1 Peter 5th chapter, verse 6 and, 6 and 7, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Realizing our continuous uh, dependence on the Lord leads to steadfastness in prayer. A neglect of prayer leads to indifference and a feeling of self-sufficiency. In verse 13, it goes on saying, uh, continuous thought, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality, and that's where the that sentence ends. 
realizing their own dependency on the Lord, the faithful Christian realizes his duty to his brethren and will contribute of his means to their need. Make their needs your need. When brethren fall into want, make it your want to the full extent of your ability to relieve them while exercising prudence and so, so doing with their ultimate good in mind. <clears throat> As the words of, <clears throat> of Paul recorded in Galatians 6, chapter verse 10, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. <clears throat> Given to hospitality means to press forward in tending to the needs of strangers. Someone from whom no expectation of reward is sought nor expected. Hebrews 13, chapter verse 2 says, There do not forget to entertain strangers. That's the word uh, hospitality, where we get the word hospitality. For by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. <clears throat> In an age of persecution, it is highly likely that brethren would be wandering about from place to place. Familiar, familiarity or not, tend to their need. In verse 14, it says, Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. <clears throat> yeah, curse doesn't mean cuss. It's, uh, it's the typical definition of curse in scripture. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy, the third chapter, verse 12. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Consequently, persecution was to be expected. There is a natural temptation for the persecuted to implicate the evil on those instigating uh, persecution, which is likely undeserved. Could be, but it's likely undeserved. If cursing were permitted, no matter how well deserved, it would result in a vengeful, a vengeful spirit. Rather, the Christian is to choose the hard task of invoking a blessing on the persecutor, which is in accordance with the high standard of Christ. As the Apostle Peter wrote, do not return evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you are called to this, that you may inherit a blessing, 1 Peter 3rd chapter, verse 9. <clears throat> In verse 15 of Romans chapter 12, it says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Do not envy a brother in Christ who is joyful over some good fortune, whatever form that good fortune may take. On the other hand, when life's misfortunes overtake a brother and he is filled with sorrow, do not be glad but sorrow with him. In all correspondence with your brother in the faith, be totally unselfish, showing at all times a heartfelt interest in his state, be it prosperous, or adverse. <clears throat> Verse 16, be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. <clears throat> so be of the same disposition towards uh, one another. Do not love one brother and hate another. Do not honor one and spite the other. Do not wish one well and another ill. In your disposition, be the same to all. Do not be proud in your views and conduct. Do not give the appearance of being better or greater than someone else. Do not set your heart on high places, high things, high life, high company. Much of these things are hollow and insincere. Instead, be led along by humble thoughts, humble ways, 
and humble things that comport with the spirit of humility. Christ was meek and gentle. Be like him. When sitting in judgment of yourself, do not justify yourself despite the clear evidence to the contrary. Such self-righteousness is the manifestation of mere vanity and self-esteem. Rather, labor to be wise in the sight of God by doing his will and in the sight of wise and good men by always doing right as God defines the right. <clears throat> In verse uh, 17 of chapter 12, it says, Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard, and uh, King James has provided, and ASV has take thought. Have regard for good things in the sight of, of all men. <clears throat> Repaying evil for evil must necessarily exclude mercy. Evil visited, visited upon us how, uh, has the effect to, to arouse <clears throat> our emotion and cloud our judgment. <clears throat> In criminal and civil jury selection, the lawyers will strike all potential jurors who are emotionally involved in the issue being adjudicated. Not only are we to do those things which are all reasonable and good men consider right, being Christians, we will try to discover the good things in the light of the gospel and regard these things highly. <clears throat> to have regard is to think about what one would do under such and such circumstances and not be caught unawares as to how to act. In verse 18, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Certainly it is not possible to live at peace with some men because they will not have it so. Between Christian brethren, there should be no uh, discord among ourselves, but at times this is not possible because of false doctrine. We should do our best, however, to be at peace with all men without sacrificing truth and duty. We should not be meddlers in other uh, men's affairs for the sake of meddling. We must contend earnestly for the faith, always. And of course, the truth preached to sinners will disturb some, and you, you want it to in some cases. Also, some Christians are rebuked and exhorted will not like it, but their reaction is not dependent upon you. It is their disposition of heart that disturbs the peace. In verse 19, beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. It said uh, in verse 17, uh, repay no one evil for evil. The first is uh, simply uh, simple retaliation. Here it is judicial retribution. We are not to sit in judgment on our injurer, decide on the time and degree of punishment due him, and then impose it. In such case, one is not sufficiently detached to allow an impartial judgment in the case. Christ did not seek retaliation, nor should we. The Lord cares for us, and he will render a righteous judgment and mete out the appropriate punishment. When mercy is justified, he will extend it. We may not be so charitable, so let him punish the wrong. The Lord says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. The right of punishment belongs absolutely to the Lord and in no sense or degree to us. 
you may be the one who is injured, but it is the Lord who must redress the wrong. He must be patient. Vengeance from the Lord will come. In verse 20, therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. <clears throat> the alternative to personal vengeance is to feed your enemy and give him a drink. He will do one of two things. He will melt his cold heart or it will make him feel uncomfortable. He will not have any evil to ascribe to you. By following this course, the Christian overcomes evil with good. In verse 21 of chapter 12, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. If we seek with our own hands to inflict punishment on an enemy, we are overcome with evil. Therefore, we are to follow the prescription set forth in verse 20. Beginning with uh, chapter 13, it reads, Let it that every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. <clears throat> I think we understand that governing authorities are civil governments. Uh, every soul, uh, quote unquote, applies to everyone and not just Christians. Although this epistle is addressed to Christians, and therefore Christians are to take note of its injunction. There is a special need for such teaching at the time of Paul's writing. Uh, Jews were naturally antagonistic to Roman authority. Uh, which have resulted in rebellion in the past and in the destruction of Jer Jerusalem in AD 70. Christianity was a new religion that had a king. Jews who became Christians were especially averse to being subject to the Roman government with its king. Pagan converts confessed Christ as their king and may have felt they were no longer subject to civil government. Hence, there was a need for Paul's plain and emphatic teaching on the matter of submission to civil authorities. Paul informs his readers that civil, civil governments are appointed by God, that is, it is his design for the, for the proper functioning of society that civil authorities exist. Paul never lived under a, a democratic form of government. So it cannot be that he is stipulating that one form of government is to be obeyed and another resisted. The design of civil government, any civil government, is to promote the security and well-being of its citizens by the, the uh, defining certain acceptable norms of behavior and commerce. If there were no human governments, no citizen could be secure in their person or property. <clears throat> Christianity does not uh, promote nor approve anarchy, which results when people do what is right in their own eyes, Judges 21st chapter, verse 25. <clears throat> Paul told Titus to, quote unquote, remind them to be subject the rulers and authorities to obey, to be ready for every good work. That's in Titus 3rd chapter, verse 1. <clears throat> the Apostle Peter wrote that one should therefore submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. And uh, that's from 1 Peter, 2 chapter, verses 13 through 15. <clears throat> As stated, civil government uh, 
is passed and enforced laws so that citizens are secure in their person and property. They are to promote uh, some degree of liberty and exercise power to punish violators. Of course, no civil government has sanctioned from God to force Christians to disobey him. In such cases, the edicts of government must be disobeyed, Acts 5, chapter verse 29. <clears throat> but even when the requirements of government, uh, government are oppressive, albeit not inconsistent with Christian duty, those requirements are to be scrupulously obeyed. People being what they are, the circumstances and reasons that lead to disobedience must be neither doubtful nor trivial. They must be weighty and clear. The institution of civil government is authorized by God uh, in all its various permutations. Not all actions of government, however, are authorized or approved by God. <clears throat> God authorized the governments of Assyria and Babylon and used them to achieve his purpose. purpose. Yet he did not approve of their actions and in time destroyed them. God does not sanction men in sin, nor does he sanction government in sin. After all, governments are composed of men engaging in individual acts, which may be sinful individual, individually, and which in the aggregate may also be sinful. <clears throat> the second verse of chapter 13, Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will, be, will bring judgment on themselves. Now let's think for a moment about the Jews that were taken into exile by the Babylonians and how hard it was for them to obey the Babylonian authority. Yet Jeremiah conveyed the message from God that they were to be good citizens of Babylon. <clears throat> they were Jews scattered among the heathen nations. Yet Peter admonished those of the, of the dispersion, First Peter uh, first verse, chapter 1, to submit to every ordinance of man, you know, which we had just uh, previously cited. <clears throat> Although there was a tendency for converted Jew and heathen alike to resist human authority, Paul says that in doing so, one is resisting the ordinance of God that ordained this authority. Resistance is more than an occasion occasional violation of some, some government ordinance. <clears throat> it is almost impossible to comply with the, the well, let's say the maddening myriad of government rules and regulations. If you want a good example of that, look at the U.S. Uh, tax code. So uh, resistance is to, is to take a stand against the government and its authority to govern. To do this is to array oneself against the government, which has its own reward, and against God. If history teaches anything, it is that God will use government as the means through which he will exact temporal, temporal punishment. <clears throat> In verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. Rulers are no fear to them who do good, but only to those who do evil. This as a rule has been true of rulers in all eras. But of course, there have been uh, many exceptions. The exceptions do not invalidate the principle. No human government is perfect. Perfect or not, governments generally do not punish, uh, punish conduct that is upright and law-abiding, but only bad. If the government rewards bad conduct and punishes good conduct, then the government is bad. Its evil practices must not be promoted nor participated in. 
uh, see we're at the bottom of the hour so we'll start here with verse uh, 4 of chapter 13 next week thank you for your kind attention